Uh, I would like to call the Lancaster Central School District Board of Education meeting to order. In the unlikely event of an emergency, if we have to evacuate the room, please note the locations of the exits. Uh, at this time, I ask you to silence your cell phones and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And tonight we remain standing for a moment of silence for Mr. Robert Deutschlander, a former board member from 1964 through 1974, who passed away on February 23rd, 2019. Tonight we uh, will start with our presentations and we have um, quite a few very nice ones this evening. Uh, we would also like to welcome our new SRO, uh, Officer uh, Greco. Thank you for coming. We're happy to have you. And we also have in attendance tonight Karen Howard, Howard from uh, Senator Galvin's office. So welcome and thank you for coming. And to all of you who are here to see our exciting board meeting, I thank you for coming and I'm, we're uh, very happy to have you. So we will start with 4.1, uh, a tenure presentation for Mr. Mr. Jason Jasker. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andy Kraisman. I'm the Director of Secondary Education here in the Lancaster Central School District. And it is my extreme pleasure to call down Mr. Jason Jasker. Jake, come on down. In, in my short time here um, in, in the Lancaster Central School District, this is, this is my first time uh, you know, giving a tenure recommendation to somebody and I couldn't think of a better person uh, to, to bestow that honor upon than Mr. Jasker. So this truly is my pleasure. Uh, Mr. Jasker is a remarkable young man who's being recognized for earning his tenure in physical education. Jason's a graduate of Lancaster High School and came back to Lancaster to share his passion and enthusiasm for the students and learning of the Lancaster community. And as I've gotten to know Mr. Jasker over the course of the past few months, he demonstrates incredible qualities that make him a phenomenal educator. He's a team player. He's a leader. Students, oh, I'm sorry, make him a, I'm sorry. He's a, he's a team player. He's a leader. And students are his primary focus. And he's always looking to challenge himself and to further his craft, both in and out of the classroom. For a moment, let's focus on one of those characteristics, looking to challenge himself to further his craft and teaching really is a craft and sometimes we kind of forget that teaching really is an art and Jason is somebody who really brings that whole idea of a craft and bringing teaching to life. Mr. Jasker works very diligently to find ways to expand his own skill set while advancing the learning of his students and his colleagues. He's a teacher leader, he's a volunteer, he's a coach, the list truly does go on. He truly bleeds red and black and I look forward to participating in future projects and initiatives with Jason for many years to come. As a Kagan coach, as a teacher leader, as a teacher in the Foundations for Success class, he participates in unified basketball, JV football, girls basketball, Mr. Lancaster. There, there isn't a whole lot that this guy really isn't involved in. He really is the total package. And he smiles all the time to boot. So he, how do you not say, give this guy tenure? One manager here in Lancaster that I learned very, very quickly is that we only hire the best. And Mr. Jasker is a great example of hiring the best. He's not just a great teacher, but he's a great person. Congratulations, Jan, a fantastic accomplishment, and keep up the great work. It's an honor and a privilege to be former Mr. Lancaster, and now we can call you Mr. Tenure. Come on, Mr. Bees, come on down for just a second. Just say hello. Come on in. Flesh. Come on in. Believe it or not, these are my parents. Congratulations. 
Here, we can take a picture. Who's taking the picture? Here, can I get in, too? Yeah, yeah, can I get in here, too? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. All right, much. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, 4.2, our Vader incident reporting from our district office directors and our uh, Lancaster High School administrators. We'll bring half the audience up anyway. <clears throat> so good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. We have a couple of presentations with a lot of acronyms this evening. Okay, so hopefully we can... Uh, make some sense of those acronyms by the time the, the evening is over. So what we have here is Vader and DASA to SSEC, and we'll explain that in a moment. With me, uh, joining me, i got to take a step back to see who is joining me here. So we have Mrs. Terry Adamack, Assistant Principal at the high school, Mr. Cesar Marchioli, Principal of the high school, uh, Mr. Jamie Pernick, Assistant Principal of the high school, Mr. Scott Bendeman, Assistant Principal at the middle school, and Mr. Greg Hare, Assistant Principal at William Street. So we all have different parts of the show here, but uh, I'll get us started. So a little bit of setting the context. I guess I'm trying to see where, where's most comfortable. All right. Violent and disruptive incident report. Vader. That was part of that first acronym on the title slide. So for as long as any of us can remember, going back years upon years, um, this is a report to state education that um, we as a school district are responsible for, as is, as, um, is all, the, all the other school districts in the state reporting incidents that occurred throughout the course of the school year um, in which consequences were assigned. You may have heard of this next one, DASA, Dignity for All Students Act. Um, that is an act that's a piece of legislation. Why do we bring those two up and why were they connected in the title slide? Well, because those two things were from really different areas within our state. One is the Education Department, Vader, and the next one is a piece of legisla legislation. Um, and those two, uh, up until the second half of last year, have not been very well aligned, causing some, some difficulty across the state. So this presentation hopefully provides the bridge to where we are now with the School Safety and Educational Climate Survey, which is what we'll be accountable to report to the state going forward, um, and I guess in the second half of last year. Additional context. You may or may not recall there was a news story about um, the Western New York schools. About 132, 134 schools in Western New York all had um, zero incidents that were reported to the state, Lancaster being one of them. Um, that was some, some additional context for the, this presentation that hopefully uh, provides some details as you go forward. And then last year we were visited and there was an audit that was conducted and we've certainly uh, showed very favorably on that but also learned a couple of things. So really the, the purpose of this presentation before I turn it over is twofold. To articulate what happens in the school um, when an incident is reported to any of our buildings. Right now we have William Street through the high school represented, but certainly we can include the K3 buildings in that as well. Additionally, we wanna talk a little bit about um, SSEC, that reporting system, and really highlighting the changes that are going to occur statewide and in Lancaster in terms of the number uh, of incidents that could potentially be reported going forward. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Pernick. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to stand over here just so I can face the board and, and face all of you. So as Dr. Kufel pointed out, hopefully after the information is presented tonight, you're going to get an idea of where the miscommunication is and where the confusion lies. After the audit, we found out that there was kind of some miscommunication as to how we were reporting, but one thing is for sure. The process by which we investigate incidents never changes. We have and we continue to investigate every situation brought to our attention with the same diligence, fidelity, and compassion we always have. So let me explain to you a little bit about when an incident is reported. Students will report incidents sometimes and they will provide us general details. And those incidents vary in seriousness. They could be as simple as name calling from one student or students to another. They can be excluding students from a group that they normally or, or, or 
uh, used to think that they were part of, uh, they can rise in level to maybe a student harassing or threatening another student. All very variable, uh, all different at all times. And please understand that the reporting of these incidents comes in all different fashions. Uh, sometimes we have parents call us, sometimes students report it, sometimes a student will be walking down the hall and hear something that they think might be bad, so they report it. Sometimes we get notes put underneath our doors, anonymous notes that help us to understand that there might be a problem in the building. So they come from all different avenues. And it's important to note that once those incidents are reported, the first thing we do, and the most important thing we do, is address the well-being of the students involved, the victim, uh, the alleged victims, the alleged um, offenders. We address the well-beings of the student. First and foremost, safety and security of that student is the most important thing, and the emotional well-being. Sometimes we provide supports at that point. If, if the incident is deemed uh, as a serious, serious event, and the student needs support, we provide that, whether it be through counseling, a social worker, whether we have to involve the parents for some outside help. That is the first thing that we do uh, when we, an incident is brought to our attention. Secondly, we begin the investigation. That's where we involve students that were involved in, in the incident, uh, possible witnesses. Um, we take testimony from people who might have information to report. Parents may report things. Uh, those are the things that we gather in the investigation stage and we talk to the alleged victim, the alleged offender, potential witnesses, and others. Then we start to gather evidence, and in this day and age, sometimes that involves social media, whether that be screenshots, texts, text messages to others, uh, threatening her, harassing comments via text message or social media. We gather all that evidence together, and we put that together to come to a decision on what the next step may be, which could be consequences given when deemed necessary. And those consequences vary according to the relative uh, seriousness of the incident. But again, it's important to note that we always investigate every situation, no matter how serious or no matter how threatening or no matter how negative in nature it is, we investigate them the same with the same diligence every time. Once that's done, then the phase begins in follow-up. We have DASA coordinators at every building, and we use those DASA coordinators to follow up, sp especially with the victims. They will go out and seek out up to sometimes months down the road to make sure that the students that were involved are receiving the support they need and are moving on from the incident. And that is a very important piece of this. As administrators, uh, we are first of all educators. Our job is to help students to understand if they've made a mistake, how to make sure they don't make the same mistake again. So a lot of time after the investigation is spent with students helping them to digest or understand why they made the decisions they made and how moving forward they could choose a different you know, alternatives to the choices that they made. So we spend a lot of time working with students on that so that they're not faced with the same mistakes again. So Mr. Pernick and Mrs. Adamick did a really good job, I think, of highlighting what the process is as far as investigating incidents that, that come up in our offices. But one thing that we really have to look at as well, in addition to this, um, is how do we report that to New York State? And what way do we go about doing that? And you're going to see after the, we're done with this slide, you're really going to see where the difference lies. So let's start off on the first side. Previous, prior to our audit and prior to um, any other issues that had come up, we were under Vader and DASA, the old um, ways of reporting. So the process went as such. Like Mrs. Mr. Pernick and Mrs. Adamick described, there was an incident was reported and we went through our investigation in order to determine certain things. Um, we documentation and investigation was conducted by administration and other people who we were utilizing to help us with that investigation. Uh, there was documentation of any consequences that we had instituted in our school management system in eSchool. And then parents were notified as necessary based on the particular incident. The DASA coordinator, uh, like Mr. Pernick and Mrs. Zanimek said, every school has a DASA coordinator and, and they conducted a follow-up with either the victim or the offender. And then here's where we had to kind of figure out, where are we going to report this? Is this going to be filed under DASA? 
or is this going to be something we're going to file under Vader? And those two pieces really didn't kind of connect at all. So fast forward to this year and kind of the middle of last year. The new way, the SSEC way, which we talked about, all these acronyms that we have. Again, the incident is reported. Nothing is different from that. Um, as was highlighted previously, it's the exact same process. Nothing's changed. We're going to go through that same investigation and, and, and document all of our pieces that we need to for our, our process. We're going to, again, document consequences in eSchool. We're going to notify parents as necessary. DASA coordinator will follow up. And here's where, where it's different. Now, instead of being reported under one of those two and trying to figure that out, we are now looking at SSEC as the way we're going to report that incident. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hare now. There's a couple of different things here. Um, it's important to recognize the definitions because the definitions are a little bit different from the old way of, of reporting compared to the new way. So under the old way, underneath Vader, Vader and, and DASA, um, I'm just going to use bullying for an example. Um, the old definition, bullying is defined as a form of unwanted, aggressive behavior that involves a real or perceived power imbalance and that is repeated or has the potential to be repeated over time. And the key word here is repeated. And that goes along with you know, the teacher interventions that are put in place, the administrative interventions that are put in place. So if you look at this chart here, and we're talking about the old way, the old definition that we used that would direct us on how to report these incidences, you'll see that we had 240 instances of behavior, negative behavior. Not all of those were DASA related. Some of them were, but in the old reporting, it indicated to us that we had to use uh, the category other to report that, and a whole lot of different things fell in the other category. So when you're looking at that, you can assume, safely assume that of those 240 instances that are listed there, there are some that were DASA related, but not all. This is the definition under the new SSEC, and, and you'll see it's a little bit different from previously. Here we have a, a definition of you know, a single verified incident or series of related verified instances where a student is subjected to harassment, bullying, and or discrimination by a student and or employee on school property or at a school function. And the key phrase right here is a single verified incident. So as you can see, the definition is very, very different. So when we're going through incidences of bullying this year, end of last year, this year, you're going to, going to see a rise in the number of instances that are reported, incidences that are reported to the State Education Department, SSEC. So I guess the reason why we're here is to let you know, when you see that rise, nothing has really changed here in Lancaster we're reporting things a little bit differently than we have in the past. And the definition here is going to change how we react to things. Um, in keeping in mind, and, and this is just important for you to understand because we're trying to wrap our heads around it ourselves. Uh, 134 schools in Western New York voted or put down zero instances of bullying, the same as us. And there was, it was brought to our attention last night actually, that New York City schools were also audited. And this is one of the comments that came out of their audit. The audit found DOE maintains conflicting guidelines on what constitutes bullying. The agency's discipline code says bullying is a pattern of behavior. While the commissioner's regulations state bullying must be a single verified incident or a series of related verified incidences. This has resulted in an inconsistent understanding among staff which influenced incident reporting. So what we're saying to you is, yes, there was some confusion between these two definitions, but now that we've sat down with, with SSEC and we understand better what they want us to do, we will continue with our diligence, with our fidelity, 
and in working with kids in investigating every single incident that is brought to our attention, but you will see the numbers look a little bit different when you see our reports. So uh, in closing, uh, we, we want to talk a little about well, what happened with the NYSED um, audit. What happened was we had three people visit us, visit the high school. Um, one person was given the entire year of 16-17's uh, folders of discipline, and he went and did an independent audit, randomly looked through folders, and decided and then made a report to us. While he was doing that, the other two people were interviewing uh, administrators, our DASA coordinator, and uh, getting some information from that perspective. We met with them, and eventually uh, they provided us with a report. So we, we actually were um, looking forward to the, um, the state looking at what we did. We were, we were very open with it, very transparent, so we were very excited to see how um, they were going to come up with results. So I have a couple quotes from them. Uh, the first one says, the list of programs in place is reflective of what can be accomplished towards the creation of a positive school climate when there is a continuity in leadership and a coordinated K-12 approach. The reason I was selected to, to finish this up is because I've had the distinct honor of being an administrator in all three of those buildings, four through 12. I was an assistant principal at William Street, assistant principal at the middle school, and now my time at the high school. Uh, and I know I can speak for the K-3 buildings as well. Uh, when, I taught, when I say that that is absolutely what we believe, and it was nice to have outside people come from Albany to affirm that. So they are saying that we have a, a district that is all about the welfare of children constantly. And well, while we will change with the reporting, because I'm not sure that the alphabet soup is over with, there might be another, uh, there might be another acronym that we're dealing with. We understand that, because it's always about trying to g grow and improve, and they're looking for data. But what we had to do is look and see, are we, are we meeting the needs of the kids? And that was absolutely true from the state and, we, and something that we already knew. And lastly, it says, the breadth and depth of the programs in place are truly impressive. I think that's a great way to end because I think that is something that we can be proud of. Uh, I know that we will continue as an administrative team, that's why we're all here, to talk about how we will grow and, and, and reflect, but we know that every time an incident comes into any one of these offices, you can rest assured that it's going to be investigated. So thank you. So uh, just a couple comments on um, the presentation, and I welcome uh, my fellow board members to chime in if they'd like. Uh, as an educator and as a uh, board member, I recognize and appreciate the differences in the reporting uh, having to do with incidents at all of our schools. Uh, and I also recognize that uh, to people who have not had the benefit of, of a presentation like this and the articulation of the differences in the reporting, uh, they may see these, uh, these numbers as a spike, right? Uh, but that's, as you all um, were able to see, that, 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 that's not the case. That's simply a, a change in the way that the state and other agencies has asked us to report these incidents. Um, what I'd also rec like to recognize and, and mirror in uh, Mr. Marchioli's comments is that uh, what hasn't changed at Lancaster is we have a caring faculty and administrative staff who uh, works tirelessly to come up with policies and procedures and works together to implement those procedures uh, so that we can ensure the mental, social, uh, physical health and welfare of our students uh, and our faculty first and foremost. Uh, and that's been the case uh, ever since I've uh, been, had the privilege to be on the board and, and throughout my, my, both of my children's uh, academic time here at Lancaster. So. Uh, <laughs> Rest assured that we are going to have, we are going to continue to have incidents um, uh, which require discipline and perhaps counseling and maybe outside agencies, but we are working diligently um, to work to the end where discipline, you know, I read a parenting book one time where it's uh, discipline from a parent, from an educator, um, you know, in a school setting. The real ultimate goal of that is self-discipline, 
so that when that child grows up to be an adult, they can discipline themselves because they've been, um, you know, under the tutelage of good parents and good teachers and good administrators. So um, we, uh, as a board, have full confidence in, in Dr. Valley and his administrative staff and the teachers uh, uh, in, in, in their work to that end. Uh, and we look forward to uh, the changes in the, uh, in the, not that we look forward to the changes in the reporting, but we look forward to the, the further explanation and the articulation of those differences um, and uh, the comfort that we have that we have people in place that truly care about kids and um, work um, to ensure their safety. So um, does anyone else have anything like they'd like to add? No. Pat, I'll just real quick. I mean, I just want to reiterate, like this is a, a shift in definition, right? So. 134 other districts and districts across the state are going to be impacted by this because they shifted the definition. But um, that has nothing to do with the process and underlying sort of procedures that the administration goes through today. So I have the utmost confidence in our administrators and what they do and how they handle these incidents. How they get reported is a different thing, right? That's going to affect the shift will affect everyone. So I'm again, thank you for that riveting presentation, which I know was probably, um, but 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 again, when you think about sort of allowing sort of the the you know parents in, in the district to understand sort of what that means um, and to preempt that so people understand what that means, uh, I think that's really important. So so thank you for doing that. Um, and again, the reaction is, is perfect for you guys to go in there, understand it, and then shift how we think about it is important. But it's not going to change what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that's important for the community to understand. So thank you for all the hard work on that. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move on to presentation 4.3, the work-based learning program with uh, Jillian Prechtel, our CDOS coordinator. Hello, thank you so much for having us tonight. We're really excited to share our experience with CDOS and our Harris Hill work-based learning. I'm Jillian Proctor, I'm the program coordinator. Cheryl Bowling, she's our job coach. We have Hannah, Cameron, Jake, and Cole here tonight to talk about their experience at Harris Hill. So I'm just gonna go in a little bit of detail of what the CDOS credential is. It's career development and occupational studies. And there's four main components that the students are working on in order to get their CDOS. And our students are working on getting their CDOS in addition to their region's diplomas. So with their work-based learning, that's what they're doing at Harris Hill. They're there every day for three hours. So they're working really hard getting their work-based learning hours. Students can also get CDOS through their CTE courses. So any of those business classes, if they're at Harkness, those are all counting towards CTE courses. They also do career plans each year to help kind of figure out what they want to do moving forward. And they also have an employability profile that shows what skills they've gained and to show that they're ready for entry level employment. Thanks. So the students are working really hard. They're not just putting in the hours at Harris Hill, they're also doing work outside as well to earn those credits. So they will need at least 216 hours of work-based learning and they're getting that through their time here. They also have weekly training plans that Cheryl's working on them with to see what skills they're gaining each week. They also have quarterly evaluations, daily reflections. We're also going to be starting on some career planning with resumes and prepping for interviews once they get ready to graduate in June. And then again, the career plans and the employability profiles. Thanks. So in talking with the students, this is what they said about why Harris Hill is important. It's really all about getting those work readiness skills because getting a diploma is wonderful, but if you don't have those employability skills to get that job afterwards, it's not gonna do too much for you. So we really wanna make sure that the students are gaining these skills and they're ready for work. And it also helps students as a pathway as well for graduation. So there's a lot of positives for the CDOS. And we also, reflecting is a really big part of what we do at Harris Hill, just to reflect on what they're learning, what skills they're gaining. And when the students were asked what an internship was, they each had something different to say, but all of them kind of had similar responses in wanting to have skills ready to be um, employed in the future and to help others in the local environment. 
and community. So we're going to go ahead and start with Cameron. Hi, I'm Cameron, <coughs> and I work in the laundry department at Harris Hill. While I'm in the while I'm working in the laundry department, it's not overwhelming, but sometimes there are heavier things to lift and fold, like comforters. I like being able to work with Dawn from Harris Hill, and she helps teach me how to keep complete the jobs in the right way. I feel like I've improved my work, my work skills. Overall, it's a good job and it's less stressful than my current job by a big margin. <laughs> uh, in, the picture I'm, in the picture, I'm working on folding cloth linen blankets from the yellow bins and putting them up to the carts to be delivered to the different units in the building. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My future goal is to gain more experience in the maintenance department. Hi, I'm Hannah. <laughs> this is Jake, and we work in the activities department. And there's a whole list of things here, but I would have to say the most important thing would probably have to be attendance, because the state checks it, and they can go and check it. Also, some um, relatives like to see where their family member and what activities they are attending, so then they're getting out more and they cannot track it. Well, my name's Jake and I'm also in the activities department and another thing I believe that would be helpful would be uh, transporting, which what you need to be doing is getting their pedals on making sure they're aware and making sure they know where they're going. And when you get to your destination, make sure you place them and you lock them so they can't go nowhere. <laughs> like Hannah said, I'm Jake. I'm in the activities department. My two favorite things are delivering newspapers and doing one-on-ones with, with the residents. And in this picture, I am helping a resident with his phone and my future goal, I'd like to experience a full day at Harris Hill and experience some time in housekeeping. All right, so this is a whole list of my favorite things. Um, I'm gonna talk about mail. I like giving out the mail to the residents. You have to have an attendance sheet and you look at the attendance sheet to figure out where their room is, just so you know where you're <laughs> distributing the mail. And um, in this picture, I'm also doing the mail with my coworker, Lori, that I met during this experience. And um, what I love most about my internship would have to be having the opportunity to brighten all the residents' day. Hello, my name is Cole. And my friend, cur who currently is not here, Brandon, are in dietary. One thing that I find important within the dietary is the storage room and the completing of it. The fact that dietary has a storage room that makes it so that, well, you gotta make sure everything's completely fine and where it's supposed to be. Dated, labeled, and et cetera. Place where it's supposed to be. And in this picture, me and my friends are getting a WOW card from the internship via our supervisor. The WOW card is a representation that me and my friend have been, act have been putting in good work and have been doing more than what we have been.
one of my favorite activities to do within dietary is to clean the dishes. Now, I know most people don't like to clean dishes. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a good thing to be doing, but I, I enjoy it. I thoroughly enjoy it. And it just takes more than just cleaning it to get the job done. You have to scrub it with all your might and want find whatever's there. And within this, you have to do more than just clean. In the image, there are three well, there are three areas where the dishes are put. The first one is the hot water with the soap in it. The hot water with the soap is usually mainly to clean it. The second one is to make sure to dry it off from all the suds and whatnot. And th the third one is to sanitize it to make sure not only is it clean, but is it properly disposed of via germs. And in the picture, me and my friend are well, at this station, working with our supervisor, supervisor, or better known as the director of dietary, who occasionally helps out when the need is there. And a future goal of mine within dietary is to be able to order food from the vendors and supplies and whatnot. Um, thank you, and I just wanted to make a comment. So that um, the first presentation we had, um, I was sleeping through most of it. And <laughs> thanks again to the administrators. That one um, was a fantastic one. So I just want to thank the students again. Please give yourselves a hand, and let's give them another hand for that. <laughs> yep. I mean, another great program offered by in, uh, Lancaster schools and pushed and driven by uh, students like Cameron, Jake, Hannah, and Cole, and Cheryl, the uh, coach, and Jillian, the director. So thanks for sharing with us. Very nice presentation. And with that, we'll move on to 4.4, .4, uh, our ESSA presentation with our district office directors. So we'll bring bring up uh, the rest of the... Dr. Koopel, do we have anyone in the hallway who um, needs a seat? All right. So I'm joined up here by Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Krasman, Mrs. Ziegler, Mrs. Camerata, Mrs. Marchioli. I will say that if you like that last um, presentation, you're going to love this one. Because <laughs> figured that's why we're people were here today for ESSA. So we're excited to have you here. Um, Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, and a little bit of student data we'll talk about today. That was a little spoiler alert because the purpose. It's upside down. There we go. The purpose of today is really to go over Every Student Succeeds Act, specifically the seven new measures of accountability. Yeah, got you, Mr. Jackson, already, don't I? It's a hook right there. That was the hook. And then, uh, <laughs> and then take some of our student data and put it over those seven measures of accountability. But before we get there, just a little bit of a look back to kind of see where we are uh, in terms of uh, really the federal government and different acts that we're going to talk about. ESEA, No Child Left Behind, and then ESSA. Elementary and Secondary Education Act, really that's a civil rights act um, that came about from the War on Poverty, Lyndon Johnson's uh, campaign, The War on Poverty. It's really the, the goal, the intent, is to help our students from uh, low-income families and low-income schools and low-income school districts really even the playing field, so to speak. 
make sure that there's educational access um, and equity across all school districts. How? It's the basis, ESEA was the basis for the distribution of federal funds. When I say federal funds, some of the ones that are better um, known are, are certainly our special education funds and our title grants, Title I grants, Title II grants, Title III, things of that nature. Since 1965, it has been reauthorized eight times, in case you're playing trivia at any point at home. And then that brings us to some of the, the two of the better well-known um, reauthorizations. First one being No Child Left Behind. That really came to, pa came to pass because um, as a nation, there was a, a thought and a feeling that we were falling behind internationally with um, different countries, obviously, around the, the world. The focus really um, became on accountability, testing, graduation rates, to improve education for all by mandating annual testing. And that was around 2002. And when I talk about annual testing, you're looking at grades three through eight, math and ELA, and then once math and ELA at least once in high school for our students. Additionally, you're looking at science in one time in elementary, one time in middle school, and one time in high school. Some of the things that you would hear under No Child Left Behind, you hear acronyms like AYP, Adequate Yearly Progress, making sure that we're making that. We'll talk about the new acronym for um, accountability going forward. But a lot of how that was driven was through looking at the subgroups and looking at really closing the achievement gaps, okay, between, let's say a subgroup would be economically disadvantaged and their peers who are not economically disadvantaged, making sure that those gaps are closed. That was a lot of the focus of No Child Left Behind. Around 2010, 2012, um, not to get too far into the weeds, but by 2014, all schools and school districts had to have 100% proficiency across all the different subgroups with all the different tests. Well, around 2010, 12, that's when the federal administration said, this is going to be very tough to attain. Quite honestly, it's unrealistic. And that was some of the intent. You put the goal beyond where you might think uh, people can achieve, and you make some progress. And there was great um, progress and has been right now nationwide, and Lancaster mirrors the nation. The um, graduation rates have never been higher, and the amount of students going on to college um, has never been higher, which takes us to ESSA with... Um, the current shift from a look at graduation under No Child Left Behind to really focusing on preparation and preparation for our students as they enter college and careers. Couldn't have been better to have the CDOS presentation before us. Um, they were fantastic. Um, Mrs. Prechtel is doing a great job with support from so many in this room. But really that focus now is getting our students prepared for life after high school. We're excited about that and we'll talk a little bit about why because we think that with our teachers and the community and our administrators, we're well positioned, but that's a little coming attraction. One of the things we're excited about, it's going beyond the testing. There are seven measures we talked about, and it's a comprehensive look at our students and their success. There will be continued use of statewide tests for accountability, but it's also intended to provide more flexibility and more um, control at the local and state levels. So you've heard me say multiple measures of accountability. It's also heard as multiple measures of success. They are, and you'll see they're kind of grouped into two different groups, one of four, one of three. Um, I won't read those to you, but I will say that as this uh, presentation unfolds, uh, there's a theme that hopefully you'll notice and you'll see. See if you can distinguish between the group of four and the group of three. A little teaser for those of you following along. Subgroups, okay? There are subgroups still under ESSA that we are accountable for um, presenting to the state. Here they are on the left side, all students. Race and ethnicity, we have six subgroups that we'll present, we have to um, report to the state on. English language learners, students with disabilities, and economically disadvantaged. On the far right here, right there, we have um, new reportable subgroups in New York State that are just reportable for the state. Remember, ESSA is federal um, legislation where the statewide is looking at gender, migrant students, homeless youth, military-connected youth, and students in foster care. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Ziegler to look into the student data, specifically the CCCR one. Okay, thanks, Andy. Now, I'm going to start 
this portion, portion of the presentation with college, career, and civic readiness. And the unique, por the unique part about this part of the presentation is that we're actually starting at the finish line. Um, when you look at college, career, and civic readiness, we're really looking at the student's 13-year run through education. And as Andy mentioned, are they ready for life beyond high school? Have we pre prepared them adequately for the future? And, and really, by looking at this indicator as a measure of, um, of school quality and student success, it rewards schools for offering challenging courses to our students. And when you hear that, you really understand why we're so excited about this. We've put ourselves in a situation with the courses, the teachers that are offering these incredible courses for our students to really make sure that they are prepared for life beyond high school. And we talked in the spring, one of the, one of the questions that we always ask is, is this something that's going to be good for kids? And you can see with the, um, as, I, as I go through the number of opportunities that are here for kids, um, that this really is uh, a driving force and, and, and one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing here in Lancaster. So let's take a look at what the readiness measures are that, um, that are being looked at as a measure for us for school quality. So we've got Regents Diplomas. Now, we want to encourage all of our students to receive Regents Diplomas, but as you heard from Mrs. Precht Ms. Prechtel and her students, CDOS is one of those opportunities for, the, for our students. Another opportunity is a Regents Diploma with advanced designation. So now we're asking students to take more challenging courses, in, um, including additional courses in math and in science. Michelle, if I could jump in just sure. a quick second. I not, to, not to jump in too far. If you just click the next two pieces there. Um, I really do want to give a shout out uh, to the teachers, um, as, you know, especially at the high school who have really put themselves out there in the math department uh, with experimenting with double block and the, uh, the labs for uh, geometry next year with, with Algebra 2. That 80% goal was derived based on some data where we're looking at our students who are going on to post-secondary studies. And we're seeing that just about 80% of our kids are going on to two and four year school. And when those students are going into two or four year schools, when they're starting in math, they're starting with calculus or they're starting with statistics or some upper level math. So this 80% goal that 80% of our kids are going to get through Algebra 2, all right, is a good foundational piece because you need to have those Algebra 2 skills in order to be successful when you get into calculus and get into statistics and those upper level math courses that they're going to be in in college. That's where that 80% goal comes from. And uh, I tip my hat to everybody who's been involved in that process, the district for investing in, in, in Trish Hustle and, and the work being done with the Erie One BOCES. Again, teachers putting themselves there with the double block, working after school, math labs. It's been absolutely fantastic, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, we progress with that. You know, the next piece with the science, 100% of our kids taking physical science. Right now, all of our students are taking living environment for that region's credit, either in eighth or in ninth grade. We want to then expand that so the kids are taking courses in earth science, chemistry, physics, and getting that second regents exam where they're exposing themselves to a physical science. That's where those two pieces come from. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. And so we're encouraging students to get the regents diploma with advanced designation. But in addition to that, as we heard earlier also, uh, students can also get a CTE endorsement in addition to their Regents Diploma. So we've talked, and you're familiar with the academies that are offered at the high school. We've got a number of different academies that our students can take part in for that school within a school feel where they can actually do career exploration while they're still in high school to determine whether this is something that they want to go into. Four of our programs at the high school have been approved by New York State for CTE endorsement. We've got two others that are in the hopper. That information is into New York State, and we're just waiting for final approval on those. So again, moving along even before this was in place. Seal of Biliteracy is another opportunity for our students to gain an endorsement on their Regents Diploma. And what that really means is students are being recognized for being fluent in more than one language. Now what a job quality to have when they're leaving, especially in today's day and age, to be able to speak more than one language. Uh, also, advanced placement courses. I've spoken to you about advanced placement courses uh, in, I think it was our, our, most pre our previous presentation, which was last April, um, and talked about how we have a 38% increase in the number of courses that we offer uh, in the past five years. And additionally, I think it's about a 90% increase in the number of students who are taking AP courses since 2010. What uh, college career 
And civic readiness is saying is that if you score a three or higher, they will award those students with uh, greater uh, student success indicators when leaving high school. In addition to that, we also at the high school offer dual enrollment courses. Now what does that mean? That means students can take a course that has a cooperative agreement with a local college. So they're taking a course here in high school that they are gaining college credit for. So in essence, a student can leave high school, what a great benefit for them, they can leave high school with courses that are actually um, taking away the time that they will have to spend taking those courses during uh, their semesters in college. So some students leave high school having a semester under their belt in college. Again, another great opportunity, but something that is being recognized. Um, CDOS, we just heard Ms. Prechtel talk about that and the opportunities that are given to our students. And in addition, uh, it's being recognized our skills and achievement commencement credential for our special education students. I'm gonna turn it over right now, talk about graduation rates again is toward the end of our toward our finish line um, <clears throat> I guess I would say I only got one slide so I'm going to try to make it a good one so I'm, they limit me to keep you guys awake so after having said that um, this is a great slide on graduation rates to present but before I get to that I just want to say I, I think maybe Michelle and Dr. Kufel maybe Dr. Vett, did you guys go to Albany or Washington and write that last requirements for that last slide right and I we can't disclose that because what I'm saying is like like talk about being in the right place at the right time for ESSA I mean I don't like all of what's in the ESSA regulations or from what I understand but talk about being positioned to like show what our kids can do besides just graduation which is pretty doggone good but look at we're, we're positioned in all those areas and we're going to get credit for some things that Michelle pointed out that if you looked at the, the former legislation, or quite frankly, if you look at how Business First looks at things, I mean, we're, this, we're positioned, at least in this area, of, of the you know, college and career ready and civic readiness to do really, really well. So I'm excited that it's finally coming around to show you know, things we've been working on for a long, long time. So with that being said, graduation rate, um, if you can, f uh, the, the main changes for ESSA are really in two areas. They've added a six-year kind of a, the sixth year that a child might be in a cohort that they might need to graduate. And our current figures show that our graduation rates go up. So that's a nice uh, figure that's added now or a statistics they added that shows that kids that might need a little more time, maybe an extra semester of, or summer school or something to graduate or just more time to graduate, that's being reflected in higher graduation rates. And then also what's kind of added to that is they take an average of those three years and, and uh, look for certain guidelines for the state. I'm, I'm here to say that in all areas, um, individual graduation rates by cohort, the three-year trend, the average of those three years, Lancaster is well above any kind of interim measures that New York State is requiring for that. Um, we're, in, we're, in great, we're in great shape. We've exceeded state targets. And when they rank um, in different areas, one, two, three, or four, we're earning fours in, in all the areas that are, uh, they look at graduation for different uh, subgroups and, and areas right now. So having said all that, uh, we've come a long way since I've been here in the district and a lot of teachers with graduation rate. We're going to keep at it. We're not going to rest on our laurels uh, because a lot of times it comes down to just working with one kid at, a, at one time to come up with a plan to keep them in school um, and so that they can be successful and latch on to something, uh, especially at our high school, and be successful in, in the way that they can be successful. So I'll turn it over to uh, you up in all right, thanks, John. And uh, exactly as, as John and, and Michelle said, um, we're making great progress. Uh, we're, we're well positioned under ESSA, and I know that we're going to continue to do, do great things. So uh, an area that's new, English language proficiency. Um, essentially, you want to highlight a few things on this slide. If you look at the past six years, 2013-14, we had four students classified as English English language learners. If you're familiar with the size of our district, at roughly that time, we had about 6,000 students in the district. Right now, um, as of this current year, we have about 48 students who are classified as English language learners. It's quite the increase and not a long amount of time, not a, a good distance of time. The um, cells that are not filled in at this current time are how students are classified. They take uh, a couple different tests throughout the course of their time with us. 
and the goal is to move them from entering to commanding. Okay, so the data that I'm going to show you here is not necessarily to be used diagonally to be able to say how students are progressing this way because that's not how it goes necessarily. Students can move multiple levels within one test a uh, year. But it's interesting to see how the number of students have gone from 4 to 48 and where they are on this, um, on this chart. Absolutely. It's a great point. The, the transiency of our, our, our L students, you know, we were just meeting here recently. I think we just lost two students, but we're going to gain a couple more, three more in the next uh, couple of weeks. Just a couple of things. Our goal is to move them over, and there are calculations that we can go into the details of how that would occur and how they're supposed to occur. We will not. Um, but it's, it's worth noting that we have 48 students. There are 23 different languages in Lancaster. Okay, just let that sink in for a second. It's not including English. Absolutely. We've seen a huge growth in people who are coming from cultures other than like Puerto Rico. And when I was teaching, probably 75% of my students spoke a second language, but they all spoke Spanish. And several people in the building spoke Spanish. Our ENL teachers do not teach all 23 of these, or do not speak all 23 of these languages. In most cases, these students are coming into these buildings and no one speaks the same language that they do. So that's an, an added challenge for us as we go about with this. Oh, thank you, Karen, for adding that. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're looking to yeah, please, please. Position, you know, a decade ago. And the whole time I was assistant superintendent, we had between four and six students who were English language proficient. And they spoke one language, Chinese. Decade later, you're talking 23 uh, languages and multiple students and multiple teachers, et cetera, et cetera. This community, whatever, I mean, it gives a, uh, you know, a historical perspective of just how quickly it ch changed and is changing. No, that, that's a great point, and to think in, in six years since 4 to 48, and, and you know, the increase is, is certainly continuing. Um, with that, we're looking to continue to build our internal capacity. How? Well, thanks to the board and thanks to the community, we were able to hire four ENL teachers um, last year, and they're doing a fantastic job. Recently, in an, an upcoming presentation that um, I can't even put into words, and really you can't, we, we had a staff development day on Friday that was unbelievable, unbelievable. The teachers of Lancaster, the administrators of Lancaster just shined. And, and it's, it's a coming attraction that will be uh, very enjoyable. But our four ENL teachers presented and they had you know, pretty packed audiences each of their sessions because people are interested in looking to build our internal capacity. And that's thanks to the board. I will say our ENL teachers that are doing a fantastic job, they speak one language. They speak English. They don't speak 23. They do not speak 23 different languages. They're not bilingual. They're helping our students access and acquire um, the education that they're being provided by their teachers and working with their teachers. With that I'll turn it back over to Michelle. I'm trying to get my steps up today here. Okay. So district attendance. Our overall district attendance for the students at all of our buildings is 96%. Great news. Yes. Bad news, it is not one of the measures. But I couldn't talk about chronic absenteeism without letting you know that overall our district attendance rate is 96%. Um, excuse me one sec. So uh, when looking at the, the measure of chronic absenteeism, what they are really looking at is the number of students who have 10 or more absences in one year. They're going to look at those students and measure them against the, the overall number of students that are in each one of these buildings. So this data is a year behind. They started the baseline data in 2016-17, and then they measured it against the um, data from 2017-18. Now our goal is within five years that we're actually going to be able to reduce this rate um, close the gap or be able to reduce the rate by 20%. So obviously close the gap is what we're interested in doing. However, what our biggest concern is now, we're in good standing as a district. What our biggest concern is though, is that we've seen increases at the K through six level. And what we really believe is that those, those increases are because of those students that actually stay home uh, as an opt out um, 
as an opt-out procedure during the, the time of the uh, state tests. And so we're going to closely monitor that because those are increases that may not keep us in good standing. So we want to we wanna really take a deeper look at that and make sure that we're uh, addressing that as much as we can within each of the buildings so that we don't uh, fall out of good standing. Okay. So you've heard a little bit about academic progress. So what is a MIP? That's what you're going to hear about now, measures of interim progress. When the state came back and looked at this, they said, okay, we're going to take a baseline from the 16th, 17th school year. And we want to take that baseline and look at your goals and look at your scores over the next five years. We want you to increase 20% every year over the next five years and to see how we're doing with that gap. Basically, we're running a race. We're in a race. So here we are with the race. If you look at our ELA goals, in 16, 17, our baseline for ELA across the district was 75%. The state wanted us to get to 80%. We got to 82 our long-term goal for five years is 117. We're doing well. We're getting there in that race. Now let's take a look at the math. Same thing. 1617 baseline was 89. The state wanted us to get to 93. We got to 102. We're doing fantastic on this race. The trick behind all of this, if you look at that 119, is I have to have those same group of kids take that same test over two years. And Karen's going to talk a little bit more about that because we are going to continue to go into that race and we're going to continue to run that race because we do have to cross that finish line. Okay. So student academic achievement, things that have not changed. Under New York State's approved ESSA program, we are still going to have state tests in ELA and math in grades three through eight. We're still going to have a science test. Uh, it currently is in fourth grade. It's moving to fifth and also in eighth grade. And then we'll still have those regents exams. So nothing has changed there. Under the old NCLB, there was a formula by which we were rated. That formula hasn't changed too much either. What has changed is the numbers we get out of it. Um, we will get a performance index between 0 and 250. A 250 would be if every student in the whole cohort scored a 4 or a, a 4 on the state assessment. Um, partial credit is given to the students who are just below proficiency. And we get full credit for the students who are at proficiency and what we call extra credit for those students who are advanced or mastery. Now this, this first, in the student academic achievement, we have two different indices. And the first one is called the Weighted Academic Achievement Index. And this one includes the students who refuse to take the test. So we're going to take those numbers that I just talked about, <coughs> where we get extra credit for the kids who get fours, and we get credit for the kids who get threes, and we get partial credit for the kids who get twos. But we're going to divide by either the number of students in the cohort or 95%, whichever is higher. So students who sit out the test are in that denominator. The other measure is the core subject performance index, and that is only students who actually take the test. So that same numerator, but the denominator is only the students that take the test. So. Let's take a look at William Street's actual uh, sixth grade ELA data. They had 415 students in the cohort and 47% or 190 197 students took the test. 33 scored a 1, and in that formula there's no credit for them. 36 students scored a 2, they get one point apiece. 69 students scored a 3 and they get two points apiece. And 59 students scored a four, and they get two and a half points apiece. So when you add all that up, and then divide by 394.25, which is 95% of the cohort, you end up with a performance index of 82. It's a lot of math in this one. So if you take a look now at the core, we're doing that same math on top. 
Same number of kids taking the test, same scores. This time, though, we're only dividing by the number of students who actually took the test. So our one performance index is an 82. The other one is a 163. Both of those are getting reported to the state. The difference there is, is just about half. Um, the difference between what we will get in those two scores. And obviously, as educators, we want to spend time on moving everybody in this group up <coughs> and not spending time talking to people about why it's important to take the test. We would rather put our emphasis into the education of students. Um, but both of those will be reported, and both of them will, will come back to reflect on Lancaster as a whole. Okay, so for those of you who are still awake, um, the good news is there are seven total indices, and student growth is the last one. And like Mr. Armstrong, they only trust me with one slide, so this is it. Um, but when talking about student growth and talking about standardized assessments, standardized assessments are important because what it does is it gives us data consistent across the state to find out how did the kids in the Lancaster Central School District perform in comparison to Clarence or Honey Eye Falls or Albany, any other school district around the state. It gives us comparison, comparative data to find out where are we in regards to everybody else, which is a good thing because then it helps us reflect on our own practices when it comes to instruction, resources, whatever the case is, so we can maximize the experience for all of the kids, not just our 4A kids, but all of our kids in the Lancaster Central School System. It's very, very important. Now, a number of years ago, you probably heard of student growth scores as part of the uh, annual professional performance review process for teachers and principals. Annually, what's been going on since 2013 is that teachers and principals uh, in, in four through eight buildings have been given uh, growth scores. And these have been scores that have been based on a zero to 20 scale. And those scores have been based on student academic performance on the state level assessments. Under ESSA, what's now going to happen is instead of the teachers getting student growth scores, the individual schools and school districts will now be receiving student growth scores based on these assessments. And instead of those scores being based on a zero to 20 scale, those scores are now going to be based on a one to four scale. And how they're going to go forward in computing those scores is using something called a student growth percentile. And what this does is this measures the achievement growth for continuously enrolled students from year to year who participate in the standardized assessments. So let me give you an example. Andy's a fourth grader. He's, he's a happy little guy. And he, in, as a fourth grader, is going to participate in both the ELA and math uh, statewide assessments as a fourth grader. He takes both of those assessments, and Andy gets a three. Nice job, Andy. You did great work. All right, room for growth, but that's great work. So in the following year, when he gets into fifth grade, he's going to participate in the assessments again. And when he participates in the assessments again, the following year, he gets a four. Andy shows growth. Nice job. Now what happens is, as a district, we are now going to receive a growth score for Andy's performance. When he participated as a fourth grader in that, in that first year of, of participating in that assessment, he is then put into a category with other students like him. He's, he's a male, he's, uh, he's white, um, you know, he has a similar socioeconomic background, student with disability, whatever the case is. All of those kids are all lumped into a category and they're compared against each other. And that's the category then when Andy takes the assessment the following year, he's gonna be compared to how he performed against that group of students. When he moves forward to the next year, he'll be compared to that level of students the following year and so on. But let's say in sixth grade, the determination is made that He's not going to participate in any of the assessments. And then when seventh grade rolls around, he says, you know what, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna take the math in ELA again. There'll be no growth score that will be given to the district that year for Andy's performance because he did not take the assessment the prior year. So it's very important that on a year-to-year -year basis that our students continuously, to show that growth and to show that progress, that those students are continuously taking those exams year after year after year so that we get the best data possible in computing these student growth scores. So if you remember back at the beginning, Dr. Kufel had put this slide up here and he said those top four, college and career civic readiness, the CCR, not to be confused with the Creedence Clearwater Revival, uh, graduation, right? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> graduation rates, English language proficiency, chronic absenteeism, category one, and then the second category at the bottom, student academic achievement, 
academic progress, student growth. So the question that we asked at the beginning was, what do those top four pieces have in common? And then what do those bottom three pieces have in common? Anybody want to take a, a shot in the dark? If not, we'll just give you the answer. We'll just give you the answer. All right, so if you take a look at those top four, these are things in which we can control. We can control the programming. We can control the steps in which we are taking to get kids the help they need to increase graduation rates, to get the help, support, and resources, resources for our uh, English language learners, uh, to hook up with outside agencies if, if we're having issues with absenteeism. Academic achievement, academic progress, student growth. Anybody want to take a ballpark guess at that one? Yeah, we can't really control that. And these are things that could be impacted by student refusals moving forward. All right, Th that could be a big, big piece and what could impact our overall performance as a district on those bottom three pieces. To bring it home, I'm going to give it back to Dr. Kufel. Thanks, Andy. So really to, to bring it home, you know, the, the last acronym that we're going to leave you, I think Michelle touched on it and I think John touched on it. Good standing, GS. Yeah, it's no longer AYP. So um, could we have done just one slide and said right now LCSD equals GS? Maybe we could have, um, but you would have missed a little bit of the excitement understanding of ESSA. ESSA is much more comprehensive than No Child Left Behind. Um, there are a lot of very good things that we are excited about in terms of its comprehensiveness that, uh, that No Child Left Behind didn't have and were well positioned as you'd hopefully heard throughout the course of the evening. Um, and, and we are excited about that. For all the indicators and, and all the different subgroups and all the different uh, um, potential levels where we're at, we're in good standing. We're looking forward to making more progress and looking to use um, what is already moving forward. I guess the train on the tracks, good timing, and, and just keep on going with this. Any questions? Just to pile on for one second. Please do. And that is, um, you know, it was back in 2015, 16, we had uh, open sessions and public forums about uh, the opt-out movement and that whole thing, and uh, I wasn't always the most popular guy here, and maybe I'm still not, but I'm just going to be honest with you like I was honest at them, and that was that, hey, listen, this is a federal legislation. Before, it was No Child Left Behind, and now it's ESSA, and we predicted that it wasn't going to change, that people have to take tests, and they have to do that, and we also said, well, it's the parents' right, and, and they can do that, and that's perfectly fine, and we understand their position. Let's not forget the fact that there are reper repercussions for this school district and every school district in the land. And so when you look at this, it's LCSD equals GS, but for how long? So when you look at the numbers, the difference, the true number is that we're 162. Our kids are doing great, and they're absolutely fantastic, everything else. But it's not divided by that number. It's divided by the number of kids that actually took it, and now we're an 82. No one's going to be going out there and saying, oh, well, they're really an eight, a 162. No, they're going to say they're an 82. And then I also, back in 2015, 16, I told you the story of 2007, and I'm going to tell you it again. In 2007, this school district was uh, designated as a contract for excellence school district. It was one of 14 school districts who was, were put on a list because they didn't have enough students take the test. Still the same number. You have to have 95% of the students. You had to in 2007, and you have to now in 2019. And when you don't, they put you on a list. And in 2007, they put you on a list called the contract for excellence. And we were sitting there, and I remember I went to Albany to complain to uh, senators. <laughs> Senator Gallivan wasn't there at the time. It was Senator Volker. And I went to about 14 different senators and explained to them over and over again and saying, listen, we have 99% graduation rate. Our students are doing great. We have more kids taking AP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we're on this list is that we didn't get 95% of our students to take the test. And they didn't care. Those guys did. They took us off the list. We eventually got off. It took me about seven, eight trips. Uh, eventually they got it and they took those 14 school districts off. But while that happened, it was about a year, they took $2.7 million of our money and told us how to spend it and everything like that. So what I'm telling you, and I told you in 2015, and I'm going to tell you again today, LCSD equals GS, but for how long? And there's another important component here. 
the real value is for us as educators in this school district, if you take the test, we can design programs, whether it's academic intervention services or special ed programs or so many other things, helps and supports to get you where you need to go. But without that data or information, we are hampered uh, by the lack of that information. So again, I'm gonna keep on saying it. We're gonna see how this plays out. Nothing's changed, unfortunately. The federal government hasn't changed the necessity and the mandate to take the tests. They haven't changed how it's going and that while it's in a different uh, letter system and a different, you know, letters and everything else, it's very similar. So it's really important to know this and we can continue to debate it and discuss it and everything else. But as uh, um, long as people, I appreciate this, kind of, this uh, presentation so people know the truth. People know what's really going on and how this actually p plays out. So when LCSD or if LCSD is not GS, then at least people understand uh, why that is. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for understanding and uh, I appreciate this presentation. So, um, yep, just a last comment. Um, you clap it up, yeah, yeah, let's clap it up. I just wanted to say that uh, if you notice how uh, the superintendent, he gets all fired up when he, he talks about that, right? And being board president, I meet with him regularly and I've heard that speech like a hundred times and he's, he's fired up and he's, he believes in it and it's because that, you know, we don't want anything that um, is gonna be a poor reflection upon Lancaster given the fact that we put students first and, you know, the winds of change from the state and federal level change uh, quite a bit, they blow quite a bit. What does not change is the course that Lancaster is on to develop good curricula, uh, have good teachers, have good programs, and uh, change and evolve to meet the needs of students and not to meet the needs of the state and, and the federal government. So um, hats off to Lancaster. Again, thank you for the clarification and articulation of the data. So we'll move on to 5.0 correspondence. Uh, we received 5.1, we received a letter from uh, the LMS Drama Club on February 19th. 5.2, we received a letter from Raymond Carr dated February 20th. And we 5.3, we received a letter from Jessica Wagner on February 28th, 2019. 6.0, approval of minutes. Uh, 6.1, could I have a motion to accept the regular session minutes from our February 11th meeting? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. Uh, 6.2, could I have a motion to accept the budget work session minutes from our February 25th meeting? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 7.0, items from staff organizations. Anyone from the Lancaster uh, Administrative and Supervisory Association? In the interest of time, not the <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sadler. <laughs> 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 Anyone from the Lancaster Central Teachers Association? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kirsch. Anyone from the Lancaster Association of Service Personnel? Anyone from the Lancaster Association of Substitute Teachers? Okay, 8.0 board reports. Does anyone from the board have anything they'd like to report? Hearing none, we'll move on to 9.0, Superintendent's Administrative Report, Dr. Valley. Yeah, two quick things. Absolutely fantastic uh, staff development day on, on uh, Friday. Um, thank you so much to dozens and dozens and dozens of teachers who uh, took time to present to their colleagues. Uh, thank you so much to administrators and teachers and support staff who uh, put that day together. Just absolutely fantastic. I think it was the best one ever. And uh, so many great uh, comments from so many people and just real proud to be a part of the school district from that day. Um, hats off to everyone. There's way too many people to uh, thank individually or whatever else, but what a great day. And it would add bonus uh, just personally I walked you know I got to five sessions and in between there were about five, uh, ten minute breaks uh, to uh, travel from class to class and there were uh, leadership students who uh, were dressing the halls and the and the in the halls and the windows and those kind of things with their own pieces and not only doing that but presentations to faculty and staff but having said anyway 
at least five or six occasions I saw leadership kids interact with teachers and they're like, oh my God, Jill, I haven't seen you since kindergarten. And what a great moment that was for faculty to interact with uh, students at the high school that they hadn't seen in so many years. But great, great day. Kudos to all of you involved. Uh, absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Valley. 10.0, old business. Anyone have any old business they'd like to discuss? 11.0, new business, 11.1, .1, personnel items, 11.1.1, .1, uh, could I have a motion to accept the personnel changes? So, second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 11.2, education items, 11.2.1, .1, could I have a motion to accept the Committee on Special Education's report? So second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 11.2.2, .2, could, uh, could I have a motion to accept the Committee on Preschool Special Education's report? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 12.1, business, or 12.0 business and financial items. 12.1, uh, could I have a motion to accept the financial items? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 12.2 is for information only, second policy reading of 5741 drug and alcohol testing for school bus drivers, and 12.3, uh, second policy reading for 7530, child abuse and maltreatment. Those will be voted upon at a future meeting. Uh, 12.4, 5, 6, and 7 uh, are all contracts with various school districts, East Aurora, Amherst, West Seneca, and Williamsville uh, for health services. Uh, could I have a motion to accept those contracts? Second. Any questions or comments on any of those? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.8, uh, could I have a motion to accept the 2019-20 school calendar? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 12.9, uh, could I have a motion to accept the 2019-20 classified staff holiday schedule? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? So moved. I love the participation. 12.10, uh, could, could I have a motion to accept the uh, various providers of special education? These are a list of special education outside services that we contract for. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.11 is the Lancaster, could I have a motion to accept the Lancaster Association of Service Personnel contract extension? So Second. Any questions or comments about that extension? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 12.12, .12, could I have a motion to accept the confidential employees contract extension? So moved. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.13, could I have a motion to accept the managerial administrative contract extension? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 12.14 is the legal notice for our annual budget proposition vote and trustee election. Um, could I have a motion to accept that? Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.15, could I have a motion to appoint election workers? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments there? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. 12.16, could I have a motion to accept the 12, uh, the risk assessment and cybersecurity audit? So moved. Second? Or, I can't say. Second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, Mr. Gallagher has some uh, comments. Yeah, before we vote on this, um, I just want to let you all know, we uh, before the meeting, the audit committee met, um, and we talked about some of the risk um, the risk assessment and cybersecurity audits. Um, nothing of concern for us um, as a district, but just wanted to let you all know that, um, you know, we went through the uh, the meeting with, um, with our audit committee and, and uh, approved um, their findings, and we'll look at the recommendations down the road. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.17, could I have a motion to accept the sur surplus equipment report? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.18, could I have a motion to accept the food service operating reports from January 2019? So moved. Yeah. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.19, could I have a motion to accept our club creations, which are new clubs, and we are approving their existence this year? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? I just have one, one comment. I'd just like to commend. You know, uh, 
Thanks, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> the, 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 the teachers uh, and, and anybody else who, who does the, these clubs, I mean, <coughs> just keep hearing more and more every year about new clubs. You know, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of work involved in that. And, you know, that they basically do it for the love of these kids. And, Uh, all those, in, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So moved. Twelve point twenty are uh, contracts with Young and Wright Architectural. Could I have a motion to accept those contracts? Mm -hmm. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. Twelve point twenty one is our RFP award for our Universal Pre K program. Could I have a motion to accept that award? Mm -hmm. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All right. Those opposed? So moved. 12.22 are the change orders uh, for our capital project. Could I have a motion to accept the change orders? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.23, uh, could I have a motion to accept the auction results? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 12.24 is our Ocu uh, OcuStar workplace compliance. Uh, which has to do with our drug testing. Uh, could I have a motion to accept that item? <laughs> Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. 13.0, public hearing. Uh, we have come to welcome to all those who have come to observe this meeting this evening. This is a time set aside for public hearing, a time when we invite members of the community to share ideas and concerns with us. We welcome this opportunity to hear from you. Each person is given up to five minutes in which to address the board. This is a meeting held in public rather than a public meeting, which means we will not be engaging in a dialogue with members of the community this evening. Rest assured, we are listening carefully and we take seriously what you have to say. I would like to ask that you demonstrate respect for us and for one another by speaking to the issues, giving us ideas and sharing your opinions, but not engaging in any personal attack. This policy will be strictly enforced and anyone violating the policy will be barred from addressing the board in the future. Thank you for your cooperation. Uh, first, we have Mr. Jerry Pico. Mr. Pico here this evening. Okay. And okay, we'll go to number two. Uh, we have Matthew and uh, Kelly Dwyer. Are Mr. and Mrs. Dwyer here this evening? Okay, hearing none. Okay, that being observed, 14.0 executive session. Uh, and so at this time, the, the public portion of our meeting is pretty much concluded. I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. Our next meeting will be April 8th. We have a budget work session in this building at Central Avenue School uh, at 6.30. And then our next uh, regular session meeting will be April 16th at Como Park Elementary School at 7 p.m. Uh, with that, thank you for coming. May I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss a particular personnel issue, pending litigation, and uh, to meet with our district attorney. 